Okay, hi, Greg Williamson, founder of 180 Degrees Mortgage Professionals Academy. It's my second video in the series for 2013, what should broker owners be doing or thinking about. In the first video, I laid out the case that I should be considering a pivot. If I'm on the way up, I'm at the critical point, or I've been plateauing, I need to make a strategic critical decision on how I'm going to change something and change something big probably to get to my next big game. If I'm on the way down, positive or negative, I gotta, well if I'm on a way down on a positive route, then I wanna make sure I stick through, I push through and continue to push on my plan in the face of all resistance and adapt. If I'm on the way down on a negative route, then I gotta come up with a plan and a strategy really, really soon, and I gotta lean on the support network that I have so that I can make that curve at the rock bottom so I can be on the way up again and back to my next big game. So why is what, here's another way that I'd love to be able to frame this and think about it for you. Here's the structure of our business. Here's your major network, you know, for those of us, you know, those, if, if this doesn't apply obviously for independence, but we have our network and then we have the brokerage. And then we have an agent, people in the business. And here's where, from a normal business structure, I think, how this is seemingly something that needs to take a look at, I think. I think it makes total sense that the place that the network has. I like to think of this like a franchise system, for example. If I have a McDonald's franchise or if I'm involved in the McDonald's or Tim Hortons or anything like that, the network, the franchise owner develops the systems and the tools and the strategies and the ideas on how I run my business. But I have my local McDonald's or my local Tim Hortons that is, I'm running that business. And then I have the people that work for my business, the employees of my business. So kind of that's how I think I look at our business. Now, here's the challenge. So let's just say for sake of argument that this is 5% of the revenue goes to the network, to the franchise owner, which is pretty, pretty typical, kind of right in that, that's probably the right number. Um, and so for that, the franchise owner gives me lots of advantages of why I want to be a part of that system. So that makes sense for me. Now, the rest of the revenue on a transaction, let's say that 5% and I know that these change, but let's say five to 10%, and I know some of you have maybe 15 or 20% splits to your agents, but on average, let's just say that's somewhere where it is, which would mean that the agent, the employee, is getting 90 to 95% or 85%, whatever the number is, of the revenue. Another good one to look at is the hockey strike. I mean, similar thing where in that case, you know, people would always say, well, the hockey player is the employee, and so, you know, it's crazy that they're demanding this kind of revenue from the business owner. And, you know, and how can that, what kind of a business would give away 80, 85, 90, 95 percent of their revenue to their employees? Every time I heard that, I was like, well, that's what we do in our business and in the real estate business, which is always something of concern or at least to be thinking about. Because here's the problem. Particularly if from my previous video I made the case that we are entering into a new business cycle that may receive some challenge. It may be tougher. And so all of the where does the risk lie in terms of risk you know in running the business? Well the risk lies mostly here and somewhat here. And so the very little bit of risk at this level given and for the business, for the entire enterprise, but all the revenue is going there. It just doesn't make sense anymore. It just doesn't seem like this is the path that I would want to go down. To continually grow this kind of an enterprise where I take all the risk and all the money goes somewhere else. And so, what, let's, for example, let's do some more math. Let me just get rid of this and then I'll come back. Okay, so let's talk about in that small firm that's maybe $25 million worth of business. It's probably the owner 
as the broker owner and also the agent who in that previous diagram who's making this. So it's a little bit different for that, obviously. I was more speaking in the previous diagram of a medium and for sure a large brokerage in terms of does this continue to make sense for me? And what I mean by risk, just to clarify that, is that obviously the risk of fraud and all of those other kinds of things you know, has some risk, I suppose, to the person com that's committing it, but it has a, a bigger risk to the business owner. But the other risk that I'm really thinking about is what happens if from my previous video that there is a, you know, a you know, substantial, and I'm gonna do some math right now, decline in the amount of leads and the amount of revenue. When, when I have a lot of people in that lower level and they're all like people are quitting the business or their revenue is significantly down, well, that affects my revenue and I have little control over that because my agents are not producing as well as maybe they once did. Maybe they're not adapting to the new environment as well as I like them to. And so my revenue is going down. And that's where I said the top, the network owner has some revenue as well, or pardon me, risk because if with having 2,000 agents or whatever it might be, and hundreds of them quit the business, even the ones that were doing three, four, five, six million dollars, you add that up over hundreds of people, there's some revenue there that's just gone. And or even the middle size and top people who if revenue goes down, then that really floats uphill. And I have, as the business owner and the network owner, I have risk of redu significantly reduced revenue in a changing environment that I have little control over unless I take control, unless I change the way I'm doing the business. So let's talk about that small, medium-sized, $25 million uh, agent who, if that's true, $25 million in mortgage volume, which loosely translates into about 250 grand in revenue, let's say, okay? So the, th the question is, is, well, what is that pivot that I should be doing? Most cases that I see this agent, they're still reasonably or pretty active, and that could be 25 to 50 million in revenue, depending on your marketplace, where they are the primary uh, contact on the file, they're still taking applications, they're still pretty much working inside the business and doing the deals. And that's where, when I get to the plateau, if I've been doing 25 to 40 million, pretty regularly for the last couple, three years where I'm plateauing and I'm not doing anything different. And if I keep doing the, I'm doing the mortgage applications, I'm doing the deals, I'm talking to the lenders and I'm doing all of that, the question that I want you to be thinking about throughout the rest of this video series is time is money. And where, when I can invest time, where's my biggest return? Is my biggest return, if I'm a $250,000 a year earner, it's probably roughly $100 an hour over a 2,000 hour or so a year. Does it make sense for me as the $100 an hour person on my team to be phoning the lender, pulling credit bureaus, filling out applications? It probably doesn't make sense for me to do that because would I ever pay somebody $100 an hour to do that job? Why am I doing it then? And so I need to finally make that transition. I need to make that change, I think. and so. Let's say, for example, that this person has a lead to close ratio, and hopefully you're all tracking all of these kinds of numbers. But let's just say you have a lead to close ratio of about 60%, which I think is, in my experience of hundreds of mortgage brokers that I train and I work with, that seems about right. So this is right from leads to the number of applications to the number, like pre-approvals, everything in. If 60% of the leads that I get, I close into actual deals, that's pretty good, that's pretty high. It's, really, like it's right in there. So if that's true, uh, for this 25 million and 250, I probably did 100 deals, okay? At a 250,000 average uh, mortgage amount, okay? So if I did 100 deals at 60%, that means I had 166 leads, roughly, in my business that I was working at um, and creating this result. And so if that's true, and I really encourage you, I hope you do this. I hope right now, in this time of year, when I'm thinking about I gotta make that pivot, do the math. Figure this out strategically. Because here's where I'm gonna show you that from my experience in the last six months or so, I've really seen a lot of this happening, where brokers are saying to me, 
I, I'm getting the sense that I'm making less money, but I'm not exactly sure how or why. I don't know why it's slipping. You know, because I'm, I'm in the trenches every day, all day, just gut, gutting it out and doing deals and chasing paperwork and talking to lenders and doing all of this $100 an hour work that I shouldn't be doing. But, and what happens? Well, let's say this is where I've been in the last year or so. And if I was to look out into my future, and let's say that from the reasons I said earlier, let's say that leads drop 20%. I know that's a big number, so you can put in whatever number you want. But put in a bigger number to maybe get you to really pivot, really get concerned and say, I gotta make some changes. So what if that happened? Well, then what'll happen is that I would have 132 leads this year. So it's possible that, you know, that's only, what is that, 34 different, so, you know, three, three or so leads per month. Less? That's possible, right? It's possible going into this year that I could have that draw. And it's a low enough number, three leads a month, different. I can barely notice that difference, right? Like, I, you know, like, I've lost, like I'm just on average, if I'm going down that little, that's the part where things are changing, but I don't know why. Here's why. So what happens then if also my lead to close ratio, if it goes down 10%, you might say, well, why is that gonna happen? Well, and maybe that's already been happening. Stricter competition, rate competition, you know, all this other stuff that's been going on, or the people buying down rates to get the business. I'm not even talking yet about, well, what happens if you're in the, if you, people who are watching, have been sucked into having to cut commission to win some of your deals, or if you think that's gonna be more prevalent, or if you think that lenders might cut commissions that they're paying us more. That means our revenue per transaction is going down. If I did 100 deals at 250 grand, I was making $2,500 on average per deal, let's say. Well, what happens that $2,500, all things being equal, drops to 2,200 or 2,000? Because I've had to cut commission on one out of three deals, Maybe next year it'll be one out of three deals, or maybe last year it was one out of five deals, and maybe it's gonna go down to one out of three deals. I mean, that's up to you to decide what you think is happening based on what you've been doing. If you're being sucked into more and more commission cutting or taking, you know, commission cutting comes in different forms. I might decide to go with a rate special at a lender who's gonna pay less than normal because I can get the better deal. That's the same thing, it's the same. I'm prepared to take less for the same amount of work that I did before. Was that mean, if that's true, I haven't, even, I haven't even factored that in. If we factor that in, then these numbers get really, really scary. So again, I'm looking at what's gonna happen moving forward from here into 2013, and maybe even into 2014. So if that happens, well now I've got 132 leads at a 50% lead to close ratio. That's gonna put me in at around 66 deals. So this stuff starts to show up. Kind of small, not big deal, like changes in those numbers start to show up and they and it's like a snowball. It's like the, all of a sudden you're like, wow. So imagine, like I said, if I'm doing significantly less deals, 100 deals down to 66 deals this year, just with some small changes, okay? And you can play around with these numbers all day long. Just figure out what you think, forecasting what you might be, if I don't make any changes if I don't do anything different. And remember, what happens if revenue per transaction goes down too? Then it's really kind of a bigger problem. So at that same $250,000 average mortgage, I don't think that's necessarily going up for a lot of us, that means I went down to 16,500. If I started at 25 million. If you started at 40 million, well then, you know, those numbers will change. I really, really encourage you to play around with this math and forecast and say, what could happen if this happens? If leads actually drop, where will I be? If my closing percentage goes down, where will I be? These are the most important, there's three really, really important numbers I wanna be tracking, like religiously. My number of leads, my leads to close, and my revenue per transaction. I track those all the time because I can start to see their leading indicators, I can start to see when they trend downward, I know where I'll be if I don't make some changes. So in this case, 66 deals, that's gonna be a drop of 52%. 52% drop.
drop in revenue in 2013 with very small little adjustments that I, if I don't pay attention and if I don't do something about it, then this is going to happen. Okay, let me just clean off the board and then I'll come right back. Okay, so now that we've sort of laid that out and it's possible that if I'm plateauing or I've been plateauing and all of those external forces that we talked about that potentially might be coming at me and it delivers some small little adjustments to my business that over time relate into a fairly big significant drop in revenue. And some of you may have already experienced that in 2012. And if that's the case, then I really think it's probably I'm on the way down. Because you're probably not feeling great. Remember, the entrepreneurial growth curve is an emotional journey. So if you're not feeling fantastic, you're not feeling excited, you're not feeling passionate, you're not feeling interested, you're not feeling motivated about your business, then you're on the way down. And if you're on the way down without a plan, then you're on the way down on a negative route. And that needs some attention critically stat. Okay? So, now, what should you do then? Well... I'm of the opinion that if I'm a small broker, 25 to 50 million, and I've been plateauing and I'm not growing, which is standard. Oh man, I get a, like if I had a dollar for every time somebody presented this scenario to me, it would be significantly wealthy. And because what happens is I get lulled into this, I work like a dog. I'm trying to get the odd leads happening. I'm meeting some realtors. I'm doing this. I'm doing some database marketing. I do whatever I do. I do some radio. I do whatever marketing I'm doing. But I'm also meeting all the clients. I'm taking all the applications. And I got two or three assistants that are falling all over each other trying to help me. But I'm taking most of the business. So they're really not doing as much as they could be. Or they're not as strategic because I don't let them be. And then on top of that, I just kind of, I can never get past a certain ceiling. Because it makes sense. There's only a certain number of hours in a day. And if I waste um, some of those hours on lower dollar per hour activity, it's a, it's a travesty. It's a tragedy for my business. Why would I be doing $15 an hour work when I'm a $100, $150, $200 an hour person? It just doesn't make sense. And, it's, and now, today, it's critical that I make some changes, in my opinion. And so what happens if I'm the small to medium sized broker, owner, who maybe has two or three guys that work for me? What if I decided that my pivot, my critical change, was going to be that I was going to go full time and go full effort in lead development and marketing, which is probably the thing I'm the best at. I didn't get the 25 to 50 million dollars worth of business because I know how to fill out an application really well. I didn't get the 25 or 50 million dollars worth of business because I'm really good at packaging a deal. That's certainly a contributing factor. Don't get me wrong. But it's probably because I'm really good at marketing. Now it's possible that I got that because I'm really good at what I do and people refer me. I get that. And that's going to continue to happen if that's true for you. But it's probable that I'm really good at cutting deals. I'm really good at getting selling and getting the marketing and getting leads in the door. I'm really good at being able to do that. So I should be focusing my time. And by the way, it's worthy, particularly if we believe that the next, we're going into that tougher cycle, then I gotta get out there and get more leads because I showed that if my leads drop, I'm in really big trouble. And I think it's also, worthy because it's high dollar per hour activity. If I am the 100, 150, 200 dollar per hour person and I'm spending my time, eight hours a day, whatever it is for you, searching out for business, belly to belly with business, uh, with people that can refer me and deals that I can make with one home builder so I get all the home show homes or one real estate team where I get all their business. If I'm making deals like that, then that's a high, high dollar per hour activity and so therefore I think it's probably worthy. So let's say that I hire a salesperson to do the deals that I've now created for my business. And I get it. This is that time where almost everybody I've ever coached through this period, this is the most difficult time they've ever had because they struggle at uh, letting go of the control, letting go of letting somebody else do the deals. But here's what I believe. I think it's just, again, it, it's one, what, if I want to go somewhere, my next big game that we talked about in the first video, 
then I have to be prepared to give up something to get there. I always do. I have to give up some way of thinking. I have to give up some way of the way I used to do my business or the way I framed what it is that I was doing. In this case, I have to give up some control over how the business is done and who is dealing with my customers. I can make sure I pick somebody who's really good. I can make sure I pick well, but I do have to give up some of that. And so let's go through now and say, well, let's say that if I did do that and the previous business I had 166 leads, remember? And then if I didn't make any changes, I dropped down. And so what happens if by me going out in 2013 and spending the bulk of my time, and this is a transition period, you don't just like stop and say, okay, as of today, I no longer do any business, but probably transition that over three to six months max. So for the 2013, I'm really focused on my primary objective is to go out and get more business. Why? Because I need to because it's dog eat dog. There's going to be potentially less leads for the same amount of people, particularly in the transition phase before agents and bank road reps quit and leave the business. If it's true that we have this you know, slow melt and it's gonna be a lot tougher, people will crash and burn. People will just leave the business. But in the meantime, right before that happens, there's still the same amount of people out there trying to get the business and there's less leads to be had. So I've gotta get out there and I gotta go and I gotta be stealth, I gotta be strategic, I gotta be smart, and I gotta go make deals. I gotta not one off, hey Mr. Realtor, throw me a bone. I gotta make a deal with the whole real estate company. I gotta make a deal with a real estate team. I gotta make a deal with a relocation company. I gotta make a deal with a home and auto insurer. I gotta make a deal with a lawyer firm. I gotta make a deal with a uh, corporation to get all of their employees. That's the kind of stuff that I can do as the marketer for my team and for my business as opposed to spending my four or five or six hours a day taking mortgage applications. It doesn't make sense anymore if I, because the threat is too grave. I could have done it before and just you know, bumped along because my 25 to 40 million was giving me a nice life and everything was great, but it's really up to you how you feel. Remember the entrepreneurial growth curve. If I'm plateauing or I'm on the way down, I've got to make a change because if I don't, I'm just going to keep falling and I've seen it, and I know that it happens. All right, so what if I go out there and I double the amount of leads that I was doing? I know some of you are gonna say, well, that's pretty uh, loaded number. Well, do whatever number you want. You know, do the number you think you'd need to do in order to make your business the same. You know, and you'll find out that if I, you know, now I just go out and I could double my leads. If I spent all of my time in one year just focus on marketing and doing some of the things that I just listed earlier, I can triple, quadruple the amount of leads that come into my business. And every single cycle, every single time that I transitioned out of doing mortgage deals to being a team leader and then growing the team, my business grew you know, exponentially because I focused my time at what I'm the best at, which is going out and getting more business. So let's say that I did that and Let's say that I can keep the, my lead to close ratio at 60%, okay? And the reason why that would be is because I would make sure that the kinds of marketing that I'm doing removes the, like for me, now it might be different for you, so you put in whatever number you think, because some of you might say, well, if I got a junior or a less skilled salesperson in, my lead to close will actually go down. So you, you play with the numbers, whatever's gonna make sense for you, but the truth is, I can create some marketing programs that are that real estate agents are compelled to give me the business and the customer is compelled to do business with me in order to get the cash back or in order to get the special deal that I've created. If I have an employee mortgage program and I've created a package in order for that employee to get that package, they gotta use my team, they gotta use me, they gotta use my realtor and all of that. So I can create those packages such that I can keep my lead to close ratio up because people won't shop me based on because in order to get my package that I've created, in order to get the deal in the first place, they gotta use me. That's the way I always would do my marketing. Go to a home builder, relocation company, corporation, uh, home and auto insurer, real estate team, financial advisor, and create a package such that it's helping the referral source and it's helping their customer so that their customer has to do the business with me in order to get the deal that I've created. That's the secret weapon. If I can do that, then my lead to close ratio actually goes up. But let's keep it at 60%. And if I did that, 
then I'm going to be in and around 200 deals. Which remember last time it was 100 deals, so double the business, that makes sense, right? And so at 200 deals from that previous business, I would be at $50 million in mortgage volume, which of course then loosely translates to $500,000 in um, revenue. Now, uh, I'm just looking at my notes here. So in this case, if I was putting my agent on a 35% split, the person who's going to actually do the sales and do the customer from beginning to end and all of that, then in this case, I would have $360,000 go to me. Now, in the previous example, when I was doing my business at $25 million, and I was closing 60% of the leads to the close ratio because I was getting beat up on commission and I was getting beat up on rates and all of those kinds of things. If I was doing that, then I was making 250 grand. Well, in this scenario, I'm making 360 grand and I'm protected myself against future risk. Why? Because I have more leads coming in, I have more revenue coming in, and I can sustain any type of business slowdown. I'm convinced that it is in the down markets or in the more difficult markets when I can make the biggest quantum leap in my revenue and in my business. And I can do that by being strategic, by thinking it through, doing the math, and again, you can run this math, I've went through it, replay the video so you can see how I've done the math, figure it out for you that makes sense, but make sure I at least do this. If I'm a small broker owner, one or two agents, or a medium-sized broker owner with 20 or 30 agents, whatever the case may be, then I'm absolutely convinced that I can do uh, better by um, pivoting and getting involved in lead generation. So in the balance of this video for the next few minutes, I'm gonna go through a medium and large size broker. So if that's not you, this is a perfect time for you to be able to just go about your business and go on. And stay tuned for my last video in this series and I hope to see you soon. So medium and large size brokers. Let me just clean off the board and then I'll come right back. Okay, so this is a medium sized business and let's say it's like 10, 15 or so or maybe less people that are working for my brokerage. And let's say on average, uh, well first of all, this is a great spot to be in. I love this spot. If I've been a broker owner who is still doing a bit of my own business, then I showed you what I think you should be doing. Create your own personal sales team and double, triple your leads. It's a fantastic life. I work less time. I have less risk going forward because I've got multiple sources of revenue coming in as opposed to potentially when I was by myself cranking on mortgage applications. I had one or two risky sources of revenue coming in. and so. It just makes, it's a worthy pursuit. It just makes sense. It's the pivot that I gotta make to get to my next big game. So if I'm a medium-sized brokerage firm, so I'm, that probably means if I have 10 or 15 agents, I'm not making enough money that it makes sense for me to be not doing my, my own business. So in my case, what I would do, that's a great spot because I have five, 10, 15 people, like uh, horses in a stable, that I know who they are. I know the kind of business they do. I know the kind of person they are, and so I can make some good strategic hires. I can pull people from my stable into my own personal sales team, which I love that spot. So small, medium-sized firm with 10 people in it at $5 million or even $8 million per person, and let's just go with five for now. That's gonna be a $50 million brokerage-wide revenue. And that, not including the revenue that I generate as the broker owner in my own personal business. So, because I, I want you to do always, and maybe you do this, but I really, I, I find that most don't. Um, but do the math, do this analysis on my business and sort of take a look at it and say, well, does this make sense for me to keep going like this, given the case I made on the first video in terms of the risk to us going forward. So, if that's the case, then I'm probably at a 5%, 95.5, and I don't know what it is for you, you can do this math on your own, but at a 5% split, I'm gonna be making $25,000 off of my, that was that thing I said earlier about who's taking all the risk and who's getting all the money, and at 10% split, I'm making 50 grand. So obviously, this isn't making enough money 
for me to not be in doing my own mortgage business. But here's where the problem lies, I think, in particular going forward. These people are gonna struggle the most because if they're only doing five million now, and, and particularly, look at your stable, look at your agents and say, are they plateauing? Have they been doing five to eight million the same for two or three years? If that's the case, think it doesn't matter what my numbers are. I'm plateauing, I'm not making changes, I'm not growing, and external forces start coming at me, I'm going down. I'm gonna start to feel bad about my business, I don't have a strategic plan in place, I'm nervous, I'm scared, I'm doubtful, all of that, I will start to go down and this revenue starts to go down. And what I've noticed a lot is that in some cases, some broker owners, and if that's you, hey, that's all right. Just own it, decide what you're gonna do different. But I've seen a lot where they kind of get to that place where they just ignore. They just sort of forget about these people who are floundering. And the risk is, is that if they all quit, well then I lose that revenue and maybe that's something I needed. Or if they really start to go down, I just feel really lousy about my business. And so what if I could turn this around and I go out and create that business that I said earlier as the small uh, player, that I'm doing my own personal business, and I go to 10 of these people, and out of those 10, there's probably two or three that are great. Really, really good potential. If this was me, this is how I would do it, because this revenue doesn't make sense for me anymore. So. I would go to the two or three people and I'd say, here's where I'm going. I'm going to drive some big leads. I'm going to do some really big things for our firm and I'm going to send you over the business. Two or three people are probably on their way out anyway. They're struggling. And then there's two or three people that are kind of in the middle. May, might make it, might not make it. And so you decide what you think is best for those people. But I would take those two or three people out of the 10 and say, Let's build something different and great in 2013. You work for me and I'm gonna go get the leads and I'm gonna pass them all out to you and here's how this is gonna work, okay? Structuring the deal is really, really simple and I'm gonna cover that on my last and final video in the series. So now let me clean off the board here and talk about what would be next if I was a large brokerage firm. Okay, so now say you're a large brokerage firm and you're gonna be 50 people now let's say because you've been focusing all of your effort on growing and nurturing and doing great things for your people, that they're averaging $8 million per person. Okay, so if that's true, and you're at a 10% average gross margin, or you're, you're gonna be making 10% splits on average, I don't know, and you do this math for yourself, then you're gonna be at a $4 million revenue, which is gonna put you at a $400,000 um, that is going to be going to your sort of pay your expenses. This is gonna be your gross margin and all of your expenses, including paying yourself, I might add, comes off of here. So paying the rent and paying all, whatever it might be. You can work out, work, look at your financials and figure that out. So once again, I don't know where that ends up for you. In times after expenses, does that mean you're taking home 250 grand? I don't know, probably not, but so you figure out what that number is for you. And then remember what I said earlier about the small, medium-sized broker who goes out and does 300 leads and they get to 360. They're probably making the same or more money than you. And you probably already know that because you may have some agents who work in your firm who are making more money than you. And so, no, that might be okay with you because you might say, well, I'm probably taking less risk or I don't have to go out and work as hard. But I think I've showed you that the risk is actually greater because Maybe my rock star leaves. Maybe I have out of my 50, 10, 15, or 20 of them start to really flounder in a tougher market. My revenue goes from 400 million to 300 million, takes me down to 300,000, and then, you know, so that's a high risk. So what do I do? I think here's the, the dilemma. Some people in this situation say the solution to my problem is go get more people. Recruit like crazy and go to 80 people or 100 people. And certainly that's a path. And if that's the path that you choose, then great, go hard. Do something different, change your firm, make it something that will be a reason why people would wanna come there in a tougher market. Maybe there's better training, maybe there's better support, whatever it is for you. However, I also think it's possible that I as the broker owner can say, you know what, 
I can build some systems in here to the 400,000. I can have people support that. And then I'll go make my revenue by creating my own personal team. I will go out and do what I said on the very first one, which was for the small, medium, small broker. And I will go out and get leads because if I grew a firm this big, I'm probably really, really good at marketing. I'm probably really, if I recruited this many people, I'm probably really good at selling. And maybe I don't want to, which is going to be a problem, but maybe I need to. And so as the large brokerage, I'm convinced that what I need to do is focus my effort. I have eight hours in a day. Where do I get my biggest return? If I spend eight hours working on people who are going to be earning me you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars per year versus spending that four, five, six hours a day meeting realtors, meeting corporations, meeting real estate companies, meeting home builder companies, meeting financial advisory firms that have ten or fifteen agents, meeting um, home builders, meeting home and auto insurers. If I spend my time meeting all of those people, home and auto insurers who have 12,000 clients in their database and I start to adopt their database and we come up with some strategic marketing plan that will help get revenue for the firm and for myself, if I did those kinds of things in my four, five, or six hours a day, as opposed to wiping noses and putting band-aids on knees because people are, need help and support, if I did that, I think going into what might be a tougher market I'll have less risk personally because I'll have revenue sources coming from more than just my agents and hoping they get out there and do well because I can take control of my own destiny by creating my own business. And so if I can be over here and create a $100 million personal business or $150 million personal business, I'm in the four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 personal revenue to me and my brokerage is running nicely. I can keep my, my, my volume so that I can be a powerful position with lenders and all of that. That's what I would do if I was a large broker. In my final video in this series, I'm gonna talk about how do we structure the deal to get my people to move from an 80, 90, 95% split to a 35% split and work for me. Thanks.